I'm Jim Gee. I found the maps of Nahum, which is the only definitive archaeological evidence of the Book of Mormon. Hey guys, Cardinalis here. Today we're going to do things a little bit differently. I just got done with the most intriguing interview with Jim Gee, the man who found the maps of Nahum. Basically, archaeological evidence of Lehi's journey through the Arabian Peninsula toward the Promised Land. I don't know how better to prepare you for how interesting this interview is going to be other than to say buckle up and roll tape. I'm Jim Gee. I found the maps of Nahum, which is the only definitive archaeological evidence of the Book of Mormon. What are the maps of Nahum? The maps of Nahum are uh, maps that reference a place that is mentioned in the beginning of the Book of Mormon when they're traveling through uh, the wilderness. Remember, they set up camps. The first camp was the Valley of Lemuel. The next camp was Shazer, where they went hunting. But these were names they gave. In this particular location, they gave, they said the name was called Nahum, which made it totally different. So historically and archaeologically, we can trace back or should be able to find Nahum. And we have not only located on maps, which I found, but also on archaeological evidence, like written in stone in that same region. Like tr- what? Oh, you well, tell I'll me. give you an example. A German team, and I've worked with these Germans before, these archaeologists, were working in what we now know as Yemen. And they were working not very far from this place called Nahum, which we have located on maps. And it was at a temple site in a place called Merib. And in that temple dig, they found altars that were donated or uh, given by certain people. And one of them in particular of these many altars was on the altar. It said donated or given by the people of Nahum. Mm-hmm. Now, the archaeology of that site is 750 BC. So that gives us a time frame that Nahum was actually there at that time frame because that's much older, of course, than the, map, the maps we have. Now, we believe they had maps in those days. They just did not survive the eons of time. Mm-hmm. But this ancient map, the, the oldest one I have found uh, in the 1751, actually, located Nahum. And uh, now we have a time frame of 750 BC that Nahum was in that area. A lot of years of so-called Bible scholar or Book of Mormon scholars that never realized the significance of a place called Nahum. And that was a clue. And the first one to recognize that was uh, Brother Christensen, who was an archaeologist at uh, BYU, and he wrote an article in the Ensign, 1978, August, Interesting. Ensign, okay. and he titled it, A Place Called Nahum, drawing attention to the difference of that. And I read that, uh, I was on a mission in southwest England when I read that, and he was hoping to find evidence and had actually thought he saw the word on an ancient map, but it was a bad photocopy of that ancient map that he was studying in uh, the University of Chicago. And so I thought, as naive as I was, that I think I could find that map because I'm here in England, one of the oldest places on earth, at least I thought in my narrow-mindedness, and that would be easy to find that. And uh, so that's when I began my journey looking for these ancient maps. And why is this significant, though? Because there's no way Joseph Smith could have known what Nahum was, or even of Nahum, because this was buried under the sand, the one from seven, the altar from 750 BC. Mm-hmm. And these maps were very rare and very expensive maps that I found mm-hmm. that were not even available to the whole people in the United States at that time. So available to Joseph Smith, he might have been able to see things like Saudi Arabia, but nothing as specific as yeah. Nahum, right? It wouldn't have been Saudi Arabia. If it was even called it back yeah. then, right? It wasn't called Saudi Arabia. It was called Arabia. So mm-hmm. that would have been on maps. They just didn't have skilled map makers, okay? Mm-hmm. Those were all it belonged to Europe. 
Uh, they had French uh, cartographers. They were the most famous and most relied upon. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the maps that we had Nahum located on was by a map maker, a very probably the most respected map maker of the eighteen uh, hundred, uh, the eighteenth century, and his name was D'Anville. He was a Frenchman, and uh, he locates Nahum on his first map, or he called it his first modern map. And what I mean by modern, it was the first time they actually used instruments to get longitude and latitude. Mm -hmm. So it was more accurate. In fact, very much accurate. And uh, he came out with that map and uh, published it in 1751. Now, there was an explorer that's even more interesting. His name was Karsten Niebuhr. He was a, a, a German, but actually was hired by the Danish king to go down to that area that Danville had mapped in 1751. But he had only key locations like Nahum listed on the map. And there was a lot of empty places. And the Danish king wanted to be part of this age of discovery. And so he put together an expedition to go down and find more details of that Arabian Peninsula. And Karsten Niebuhr was uh, the mathematician, surveyor, and cartographer of the team. Uh, they went down there. They started exploring and mapping. And when they went up near the region of what they would then tell us was Nahum, all of their men all started getting sick with a real bad fever, and they all died, but Carson Niebuhr was the sole survivor of the expedition. So when he got back, it took him a year and a half to get home. When he finally got back, uh, he wanted to make him a memorial for his men, and he wrote a journal and had it published in two languages, French and German. And... Uh, I have this, this, this journal here is one of them. This That's is a, a French, first edition. This is a French edition. It is. Oh, a first wow. edition. Okay. It's almost 300 years old. But I had, and it has a whole chapter on Nahum, by the way. But at the back, you have a copy of his map of the region. Oh, oh my gosh. And right here, if I can turn it oh, around. Gotta, yeah, let's get in there. Get in here. I want to be real careful not to. This has, hasn't seen much sunlight, as you can see. Right there in an area is Nahum. Oh my gosh, there it is, Nahum. But he also, in his cartouche, explained what Nahum is. It's a principality. He even names it up here. He names the principalities of the area of this map, and Nahum is one of them. So it not only tells us it's not a tribe. Mm. Many people thought Nahum was a tribal name. It was not. It was a like a country, a principality, and he's laying, he's identifying it right here in his cartouche. And of course he does in the book too. But then this is the boundaries of what he was told the word, the boundaries of Nahum. Well, where is this in relation to Jerusalem? Let's start doing the internal geography. Oh, we got to get a bigger map to do that. And we'll have bigger ones. Oh, well, dude. So uh, hey. let, let me... Uh, uh, Jim, if I, can, if I can ask a question. Sure. That looks far... That represents Nahum being far larger than what a lot of... Um, well, that's because people think it's just one little teeny place. It's yeah. not. It, they just said a place called Nahum. Well, it was a big geographical area. You could say a place called Los Angeles. Right, exactly. Okay. And it was an area, or, and these people were all from that place. So, so it's more like, instead of saying Los Angeles, it's more like saying Southern California. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So what else you got? What do you, what do you got to show us, man? Okay. Oh, this here. You want this one can, can we just sit here for a minute and real like, yeah. <laughs> we just, we just uncovered something that. <laughs> this is very, very, very. No one has seen this. This is really something. Uh, we have to be very careful with this. This paper is oh, wow. 300 years old. Whoa. And it is uh, a map of the whole area. Look how big this map is. Right. Is that it? Yeah. That's it. Oh my gosh. There it is. Okay. And Jerusalem is way up here. But remember, they traveled, and it doesn't mention it in the Book of Mormon, but it takes nine days just to get to the Red Sea. This is the Red Sea in Aqaba, mm -hmm. yeah. in a, a valley called Araba, which was a major thoroughfare coming from the Dead Sea down to the Aqaba. And instead of going into Egypt or getting on the King's Highway, they continued down, and the Valley of Lemuel would have been right down here, about three days' journey from Aqaba. And then they went south, southeast. And what happens when you go south and southeast? 
you run right into Nahum. How, how did you come across these? Okay. What was the... I was educated a lot by uh, other collectors. I found out that real significant and ancient maps were collected like pieces of art. And they were very expensive mm. and people had them in collections. And one of the guys that I was quizzing on about it early on when I was just really naive, he said, now, I'm going to give you some help here because you're just a young kid. I was in my 20s when I was looking for it. And he said, Number one, they're only going to be found in the nicest collections in Europe. When someone dies, dad had all these weird maps he collected. They then put them up for auction in Christie's and places like that. He says, that's where you find them. And you don't want to be fooled because there's secret hidden watermarks on those ancient maps. You hold them up to the sun because these meant life or death to those explorers. And they had to make sure they didn't have a forgery because that could be dangerous for his crew. So they would hold it up in the sun and they could see the watermark that showed it was authentic. So he says, you want to look for those. And each map maker had his own watermark. And then you also want to see where they pressed it into the paper because they didn't have a printing thing like we had. They had engravers engrave them in a mirror image on copper. And then they would take that copper put ink all over it, and then press it on paper, hold it there for a while, and then pick it up, and it would then show the map. And it was weird when I found the very first one, it was one of these um, Carson Niebuhr ones, and then it seemed uh, once I found and I knew these map makers, Pandora's box opened up, and I started getting another one, another one, another one, and until I had a total of 13 different map makers that located Nahum. Now, most of these collections I found was in Paris, Germany, and London. Not 1830s New York? No. They were all in those areas. Every one of these I have found in France somewhere, Germany, or in England, and mostly in private collections in London. Okay, so we can basically say that due to these primary sources and artifacts that you found that include the map or the location of Nehom in basically the exact spot that the Book of Mormon says describes it, it. Describes mm-hmm. it yes. That we can say, okay, we know this place existed, that the internal geography of the Book of Mormon, at least in those first four to six chapters, is uh, basically been, quote, proven, end quote, for lack of a better term. Um, is there anything else on these maps geographically that aids towards um, corroborating the story of Lehi in the desert, or is this kind of a one-hit wonder? No, no. Hey guys, Cardinalis again, and thanks for hanging out with us and Jim Gee talking about the maps of Nahum. Uh, We've got quite a few of these interviews coming up, and he has quite a few evidences for Lehi and Nephi's journey through the Holy Land and the Arabian Peninsula that we are going to be sharing in a couple of upcoming videos. We're going to make a series out of this. In order for you to better enjoy the series and not miss anything, please consider subscribing to our channel. Uh, If you subscribe, also make sure that you press the alert button to get each one of our videos. I go through the analytics and I see about 41% of you guys have not yet created accounts, so you're not seeing all of the videos that we drop. Also, if you really like our content, please consider contributing to the channel through the Venmo link that is in the description. You can find us at Midnight Mormons through Venmo if you would like to contribute. Again, we know in this attention economy, there's many other channels that you could be spending time with, yet here you are choosing to spend this time with us. We are grateful and we thank you. Until next time, see you in the next program. See you in the next program.